Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Rich. This is very exciting. Oh, good to be here, Harry. Thank you. I do want to start, though, on you. So tell me, tell us, how did you make your way into the world of startups? And what was the founding story and that initial kind of aha moment for you with Trey? Sure. So uh, we started the company seven years ago now, but really the kind of founding story goes back much further than that. So uh, there are two co-founders in Trey, myself, Alistair, and Dominic. Uh, I went to university with Alistair, gosh, probably 16, 17 years ago now. Uh, and we were kind of based down in Southampton, uh, which is you know an hour south of London. There isn't a burgeoning tech scene there. We sort of follow technology companies through places like TechCrunch and things like that. And we sort of always were inspired by these companies and looked for a way that we could ultimately uh, start one. And uh, it was kind of through that process of us starting to work, to work together, sort of playing with different ideas that eventually led us to figuring out, OK, how do we actually turn this into a business? What, what do we go and do now? Uh, we moved to London in 2010, um, hadn't saved up any cash, so spent a good year and a half of uh, sort of couch surfing and, and finding out different ways to survive, um, and eventually managed to get uh, the company off the ground in 2011, 2012, when we joined an accelerator here in the UK called Springboard, uh, and that's sort of where we finally got together and were able to work on our idea for three months, kind of uh, unaffected, as it were. I mean, the journey since has been kind of incredible to see. I do want to start there because we chatted before and you said, obviously, Trey is solving a very difficult problem. Some call it deep tech. And you said that talent in the EU is here, but the VC patience is not. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, that's completely true. I think in, in Europe, we have uh, just an incredible array of technical talent. There are great universities. There's a lot of individuals that are, that are uh, extremely talented in all kind of breadths of, of engineering. And in order to build a company that has real residual value, I think you've got to build up some sort of technical moat. You should be trying to solve a very hard problem. And that takes time to do. And so at the time when we started the company, uh, there wasn't great access to seed capital. And when there was, there was sort of, you know, it was more about uh, already being in that kind of growth mode, already having that traction underway, and not having time to be able to work on something that would ultimately lead to a kind of deeper technology and, and build a bigger business. Uh, we ended up moving over to San Francisco and raising our seed round there because we found that uh, investors had a, a better grasp of you know, raising a sort of one to two million dollar round, investing and spending their time to scale out that initial technology and, and really get the business off the ground. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that I think that's changed a lot in the last you know, six to seven years as we've seen the sort of investment vehicles change here and the amount of funds that exist and also the way in which investors think. Uh, we're starting to see more of that technical knowledge come back into Europe mm -hmm. and, and invest in those sorts of companies, which ultimately I think lead to you know, much better outcomes. I do have to ask, you know, Trey's been a seven year journey to this point. In terms of, I often speak to obviously other investors and they say like, oh, you know, if it's more than 18 months old and they haven't raised a round, it just doesn't look good, and I'm not going to check it out, to be quite honest. How do you feel when you hear something like that? Is that, is that a fair assumption from the VC, and it means it's lacking credit, maybe? I think it is very dependent on the VC. So that, is, that, that does happen uh, in a sort of extremely common way because of the way that um, investors have to invest their funds, you know, the, the way that the life cycle of funds work and the pressure that's on the investor themselves. I think what you tend to find is that uh, investors that have been around for a long time, that uh, have already got a few wins under their belt, are able to look and invest in companies that have taken a bit longer to get to market, which usually is for a good reason, such as investment in product or trying to tackle regulation, which is something else that can, that can slow down that initial growth phase. Um, it's really frustrating if you're on the other end of that. And I think it's really the, the founder's job to try and figure out what the psyche of that investor is, where they're at in their career, and how you sort of ensure that you're both positioned correctly to be able to engage and, and ultimately build a partnership together. When you think about that partnership, you, you raised from uh, mutual friends of ours, Alex Clayton and Alex Curland. Uh, I, I do have to ask, and maybe advising founders in the audience, how is the right way to think about investor selection? And maybe what made you choose the investors that you chose when you did have an array of choices? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that partnership is uh, one of, if not the most important relationship that you build in the company. Um, those investors that sit on your board or hold positions in the organization, uh, ultimately, 
you know, you, that they're there for you to rely on when uh, times are tough or when things are extremely good. You want them in your corner. They have to support you. You need to be able to talk to them openly because you're really trying to figure out how to scale the business together. Um, on more than one occasion, we've picked a fund or a partner over a higher valuation from another um, organization because we just felt that that individual had a better understanding of us as a business. And ultimately, you're thinking about what the company looks like in eight to 10 years rather than what happens today. Uh, so I just think that, that that relationship is really key and you really need to spend time you know, building that up and developing it. Asking for, as a VC's perspective, wanting to win the best deals, you said there about kind of the understanding of the business being super granular. How can they show that to you? How can they effectively kind of present the work that they've done, the thought process that they have, and why they're excited about your business to you? And, and how did maybe Alex Clayton do it? Yeah, so that, uh, that changes a little bit at each stage. So from the earliest stages, the people that ended up investing in us, um, I actually built relationships with over a very long period of time, you know, over a year and a half, in some cases two years. And it may have been that you know, we weren't quite in the right space to raise from that fund at that time, but they were able to use that time to get updates from us, to be able to come back and um, discuss challenges that we were facing, and they had you know, insight into parts of the market that we perhaps weren't aware of. So, that's one way that is demonstrated from a, from a VC. Uh, in the kind of later rounds, um, we were presented with a sort of full docket of prep, uh, sort of prepared notes and a full slide deck from the fund that showed customers that they'd interviewed, prospective customers that they found, market insights, um, even product feedback to a degree. So that it was really a kind of a deep view into where we are today and where we felt the kind of company was moving to, and they just showed a, a really sort of deep understanding of that. Do you agree with the perspective? Often I hear founders say today that they're advised you should be very disciplined around your fundraising process. You should set you know, May the 1st, closing on May the 30th, and be extremely disciplined about the meetings, first week, second week, third week, and don't meet investors in between. That's a time to be building. Do you agree with that very kind of binary perspective? No, I completely disagree with that, actually. I think, uh, you, you know, I'm not saying you want to fill your schedule with hanging out with investors all the time, um, but regularly meeting people that can add you know, benefits to the business and could ultimately invest or, or, or become partners with the company makes a lot of sense. Um, from our perspective, spending time with investors also leads to customer intros or partner intros that are extremely useful from their portfolio companies or organizations that they're meeting. I think that, you know, an, an investor relationship isn't developed in a heartbeat. It's, it, you, you want to have met that person well ahead of time. You as a founder want to understand how they think, uh, you know, where their funds at and and the position that they're going to take in the company. And you're not going to do that by compressing it down to a number of weeks. Where I sort of feel that, that setting those deadlines and creating that competitive tension is important is when you actually go out to fundraise. So there's, there's two sides to this. One is that you always want to be building relationships. You always want to be kind of meeting people and, and, and ensuring that uh, people are aware of you as, a, as an organization and that your, your opportunity to kind of grow through that network is there. But secondarily, when you actually get down to the hard yards of fundraising, you do want to make sure that you have that competitive tension going and you are getting people to work against deadlines so that there isn't you know, a, an ongoing uh, opportunity for uh, decision after decision after decision that will ultimately likely lead to a no. Yeah. I, I, I do want to ask as well, you know, when you look at the investors that you have on board, you look at the clients that you work with, it looks all up and to the right and it looks like, you know, the, the dream always. Can I ask, in the early days when it was couch surfing, when not everything was smooth sailing, so to speak, and I know it's never smooth sailing, but it didn't look quite so up and to the right, did you ever kind of question whether it would work? Was it always that it will work? How did you deal with those really, really hard times in the early days? Yeah, so those hard times went on for us, you know, transparently for a number of years. And uh, the most important thing that sort of existed in that time frame was uh, the, the two co-founders that I work with. And actually having that base where you're all trying to get to the same position together means that at any one time when one of you may be questioning why things aren't, go so, aren't going so well, somebody else is actually also feeling positive and, and, and is excited and brings that energy in. And you sort of need to rely on each other to get through that stage. And it, you know that, that's super tough if you're a single founder. I think you need to find a network and a group of people that, that are there to support you through it. But it 
it, it can take a long time, and you do need to have an inherent belief that the thing that you're trying to build you know, has its place in the market, is going to make the change that you anticipate, so that when it does happen, like it's you know, really started to happen for Trey in the last uh, you know, two, three years, you, you, know, you can look back at that and, re and remember where you came from and use that, um, that sort of resilience to enable you to keep growing the, the company. You said obviously like it's happened with Trey, and you can very clearly see that when you look at Trey's growth. In terms of like scaling challenges when that moment does happen, for you when you review the last say 24 months, are there some very clear challenges that you've faced and continue to face that, that you think maybe aren't highlighted enough in the press and in the public eye? I think the you know, a lot of the challenges that come with scaling quickly are uh, all around uh, Adding headcount very fast, you know, we've gone from um, something like 12 to 15 people a year ago to over 100 today. And with that kind of growth, the way that you communicate with the team, the way that information and knowledge is shared in the company becomes really, really important. And that tends to be where things can start to break down or you can start to slow down your growth because everybody isn't aligned, they don't know where the, the goals are, and you have to really invest and spend a lot of time actually developing the organization itself. And so you kind of split your go-to-market it in, into two categories. One is scaling the, the company itself and, and you know, getting in front of more customers, being able to drive more revenue, uh, developing those product features that are important. And then secondarily, it's investing in the health of your company. And that, you know, I think that takes uh, great empathetic leadership. You know that a lot of people are going through significant change very fast, and you really have to be on your feet to be able to support people as, as you scale through that. I think you know, some advice that is, uh, is widely shared and known is that you really want to find someone that can work with you to do that. A people team, um, folks that have seen that kind of scale before is really, really important as you, as you start to go through those challenges. Perfect segue, because the question that's always asked uh, kind of that I often hear is absolutely you can get those people who've seen that hyperscale in San Francisco, you can get it in the US. In Europe, it's much more difficult to get those seasoned execs who know how to build out a go to market and have seen it grow from 0 to 100 million ARR. Do you think that's a fair assumption that it is just inherently so much more difficult to get those seasoned execs? And what's your perspective on that? It's definitely harder because the, uh, those executives tend to, you know, spend most of their time in San Francisco. They can hop between exciting opportunity to exciting opportunity. And where the European market hasn't had quite as many acquisitions that have led to the birth of new companies that have come from experience in that hyper growth, there isn't quite the same network for those um, execs to exist. However, I think what we're starting to see is that more and more of those folks are interested in coming to Europe. And I think some of the mistakes that companies over here make is that they only look within the European market and they only look at what's in front of them to go and make those hires or add those individuals that may be able to add that skill set they don't have. Actually broadening your market and being able to look uh, out to the US and, and to other areas means that you can find people that are looking for a new challenge. Uh, they you know, they want to bring families over to Europe and as you have that attractive, fast growing opportunity, you can find a match there. So I think it's, it's certainly true on the kind of revenue and go to market side. It's harder to find people People with that experience, but you know, from a technical perspective, there is a plethora of great uh, engineering organisations throughout the UK and Europe where there there really is that talent. It just takes a lot of work to kind of dig in and find it. In terms of kind of acquiring that talent, you, you know, I've done a couple of interviews before. Um, <laughs> uh, I've often heard "fire fast, fire fast." It's probably on about a thousand episodes. Um, would you agree with that common kind of? Uh, suggestion on the show? I think it, again, it's, it's dependent on the situation and uh, how mature your, uh, your market or your process is. I think in, in some scenarios, if you hire somebody that is really obviously a not a good fit, is detrimental to culture, and you have a fairly mature process, say marketing or sales or whatever else, then absolutely you need to make a change quickly and you need to protect the health of the team and ensure that you have the right kind of progressive talent in place. In, I think where we get this sort of knee-jerk culture is when you're still defining a lot of those things and somebody is coming in and is under pressure very quickly to make a change in you know, the next quarter or, or the quarter after that, when actually you need to allow a bit of time for them to bed in. And as long as you have a very open line of communication as to what your expectation is, what the goals are, and that you're working together on it, I think a little more patience is, is certainly required. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's easy advice to, to dish out and there are some very obvious situations that it should be applied to, but I think there's a new 
nuance in, you know, a company is scaling fast. They, they may not have developed the perfect uh, go-to-market or inbound lead strategy, or they may have not developed the perfect sales process yet. And if you're putting somebody kind of under the gun straight away for a uh, strategic reason, then, you know, it's probably not the, the smartest move. If it's a cultural issue, then absolutely. That's when, you know, things can go south very quickly. So I want to finish today by doing a quick fire round, Rich. Okay. So I'm going to say a short statement, and you're going to give me your immediate thoughts on the statement. Okay. Go okay. For it. So what do you know now that you wish you'd known at the beginning of the trade journey? <laughs> um, so I think the. You know, one of the main things is I was pretty naive as we started the company. Um, actually, the, the idea that we had and the way that we were going about it was completely right. And one of the benefits to um, the way that we kind of came up with that is that we hadn't been in the industry before, we hadn't experienced some of the tooling before, and so we actually took a slightly different view as to how that product execution was going to happen. And you can certainly feel um, a bit of anxiety or nervousness because a common thing that you'll hear from other people is, well, so-and-so companies, done that before, you know, and they failed at it, so you probably will as well. And so it's, it's, it's having the kind of confidence to be able to stick by your guns with that. But I think, you know, around the sort of topic that we're discussing today and on securing funding, um, it, it, it took me a kind of embarrassingly long amount of time to really understand uh, venture capitalists and the way the model works and, and, and what's important to them and what they're investing for. And I think I sort of perhaps naively thought in the start that, hey, they're supporters of technology and the reason that they want to give you capital is because they want to see great companies exist, which is true, but it's to the benefit of them getting a return. And so it's really thinking about the business angle of what you're doing, laying out, you know, the, the, not the fundraise that you're going out to do today, but what this company looks like at the next stage and the stage beyond that in that first deck, in that first meeting, is something I wish I'd done a lot earlier because it would have led to a far more fruitful discussion and it would have probably moved some of those conversations along much faster. What advice do you commonly hear being given that you maybe disagree with? Uh, so we were told uh, for a long time not to speak to associates in VC funds, in you know, partners make the decision, get to the decision maker, you don't want to spend too much time there. I actually um, really disagree with that. I think. Uh, associates do have a lot of swing. They are the, the allies to the partner. They do do a lot of the, the legwork that happens behind the scenes. And certainly from Trey's perspective, it was actually associates in the early days that saw the potential for what we were doing, invested time in us to really understand what the market opportunity was, and did a really great job conveying that to a partner and set us up with that meeting in a way where we sort of came in with extra endorsement. So I, I think it's, you know, it, it's not always the case that you want to run straight to the decision maker or straight to the partner, it's really worth investing in those relationships and, and having people that understand what it is you're trying to do and where the business is going to go. This is quite an unfair one to ask, but what would you most like to see change about the UK tech scene? <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, you have put me on the spot there. I think I can talk to my experience a few years ago. I, uh, we haven't kind of raised from, from Europe for a, a little while since. Um, at the time, it was really hard as a, uh, a, a sort of deeply technical product to be able to get investors to see beyond that, that kind of um, initial traction metric that you need and have a discussion more philosophically about why we saw the opportunity in the market and where it was going to head to. And so what we would commonly hear is, wow, you seem like a great team. Uh, you don't really have any um, revenue numbers for us to sort of work off today, uh, but perhaps come back when you do. And in order to build out the sort of technology that, that we were trying to, we needed to hire a few engineers. There needed to be an investment in, in place to do so. And so one of the things that I'd like to see change is that there is um, kind of more uh, technically minded or investors that have that, that, that ability to pull the trigger on deploying capital into bigger ideas that are going to take longer to come to fruition. I think what I saw at the time was there was a, a lot of kind of quick wins. There was a lot of discussions around how quickly a company could get acquired. Um, I certainly will caveat that by saying I think that has changed a lot in the, in the last four or five years. But you know, going back to that initial experience, I'd, I would love to have seen uh, more discussions around that, and more investments in companies that I think will have gone on to add a lot more market value. And then final one, what do the next five years look like for you and then for Trey? 
So I think for us now, you know, our, our mindset is, is very focused on how we scale and continue to be the market leader in our space. Uh, that takes a lot of investment in scaling headcount very quickly. We're bringing a kind of emerging market to the fore. We're trying to support business users and, and really turn them into engineers. We're giving them the ability to visually program and, and add a completely new paradigm to their skill set. And in order to do so, we really have to continue to scale on the uh, partnership front on really kind of you know, uh, beating the drum in our brand and, and, and getting trade to become one of those household names. For me personally, that's about continuing to evolve in a leader, continuing to add great people to the company that are going to make a huge difference to the mission that we're on, uh, and really just trying to scale this, this company as, as far and as big as we can possibly go. Rich, I've wanted to do this for a long time, so I'm thrilled we could make this happen. Thank you, Harry. Thank you.